So now, now we're really going to bore you. We're going to talk about how we do the testing in our laboratory, and this is pretty standard. We do a dual column headspace gas chromatography, okay, which is a lot of words, but it's actually a fairly simple process. Chromatography means a process where you separate a mixture of components into the individual components. So why are we using chromatography? We're using chromatography to separate the alcohol from the blood and all the other thousands of chemicals that are in the blood. And we exploit these physical chemical properties. Um, I'll use an analogy um, as we get further. Just think of shoppers and non-shoppers if you send them to the mall. Okay. Headspace. We talked about, we already said what chromatography was. Now we're talking about what headspace sampling is. Headspace sampling just means that you're taking a sample from the air above a liquid. Okay, the amount of a chemical in the headspace is directly proportional to the amount that's in the liquid. A, a, a common analogy is if you open a, a, a bottle of whiskey, you smell the alcohol. Why? Because there's a lot of alcohol, so there's a lot in the headspace, so you smell it as an irritant. If you open a can of beer, you don't get that sensation. Why? There's less alcohol. So there's less in the headspace. It's going to be directly proportional. We just do this on a smaller scale in a, in a little glass vial. And the reason that we do it is that it gives us very, a very clean sample. I mean, there's blood is nasty. I mean, there's proteins and fats and all kinds of stuff. If you just sample a headspace, all that stuff stays behind. The alcohol wants to get out of there pretty easily because it's a volatile. I, I've said that it is, in its purest form, it is odorless and colorless and tasteless, but you can't try doing a shot of Everclear and tell me it's tasteless. It, it, it is, it's a, more of an irritation than a taste. So I, it kind of depends on how you define odor. But I think in the, in the common understanding of odor, it does have an odor. It does have an odor. You can smell alcohol or you can smell an alcoholic beverage. Part of that is the alcohol is volatile, so it's wanting to come out of that liquid at room temperature. And it's also carrying with it some of those flavoring chemicals it, because they're soluble in alcohol, and it kind of carries some of it with it, and that's what you're smelling as well because you can, you can clearly smell the difference between um, vodka and scotch. That's because all those flavoring agents that are in scotch are being pulled up into the headspace with the alcohol. So it does have an odor. But this also gives us really accurate, very reproducible results. It's nice. We detect it with a flame ionization detector, which is really just a fancy way of saying that uh, we see how much the flame gets excited when we throw some, some gas on it. We have an electrical potential across a flame. As the alcohol encounters that flame, it burns, changes the intensity of that flame, and it changes the electrical potential across there. And you can, you can plot that in a picture. And that picture is called a chromatogram. And I've got one. This is a, a typical chromatogram that we would have uh, in our alcohol analysis. Over here on the y-axis, you've got response in millivolts. Across here is time in minutes. So this, this whole thing takes about 10 minutes. The instrument is just kind of sitting there waiting for something to happen. And what happens is eventually, through a process of chromatography, this ethanol hits the detector at about 2.02 no, .02 minutes. And it excites that flame, and it changes the potential. And the more that it excites the flame, the higher this peak becomes. Okay? Now, over, this is ethanol. This is the alcohol that people drink. Over here is n-propanol 
which is something that we add to the sample. But we add it in a known amount. It's always the same every time. It's what we call an internal standard. It's like if I were to uh, show you a picture of a tree and say, man, I went on vacation and I saw these really big trees. Here's a picture. And all you see is bark. Okay? But if I show you the same picture and I'm standing in front of the tree and my, with my arms like this and it's twice as wide as I am, now you kind of you get a sense for how big that tree is. In that analogy, I'm the internal standard. I'm, I'm the thing that lets you measure how big this is. So if this stays the same all the time, this n propanol at about, oh, 200 millivolts, this will change depending on the concentration in the blood sample. Let's go back to the previous one. In this one, we have a really high alcohol concentration of 0.27. In the next one, it's going to be much less. But remember, we've got n-propanol, about 200 millivolts. Ah, n-propanol, still about 260 millivolts. But the, al the alcohol, the ethanol peak is much smaller here. So we can, we can say that there's less concentration here. It actually does a mathematical calculation, a relationship between these two heights, this height to that height is how it's done. What we'll do is we'll set up a calibration curve where we have um, solutions with a known alcohol concentration and we'll, we'll come up with a plot and we can compare our unknowns against that known curve. You'll hear me say a curve. We'll use, why would we use dual columns? Well, Again, we want to eliminate the possibility of false positives. And the example I'm going to use is rubbing alcohol and ethanol. Now, this, is, this could be important because rubbing alcohol is most often is what is used to uh, swab a uh, sampling site for just about anything, including blood alcohol. So it would be, it's important for us to be able to know that the alcohol result we get is not the result of the swabbing with rubbing alcohol. So, for instance, on one of the columns in the instrument, we can see that ethanol and isopropanol, which is rubbing alcohol, um, are fairly closely related in time. 2.0 minutes, 2.3 minutes. Maybe if things weren't perfect that day with the instrument, you might confuse one for the other on the, if you were just using this column. By changing the chemical properties of the column within the instrument, and this is the, this is the same analysis, the same, very same sample done at the very exact same time, now, well, those, were, those two were separated, at least by 0.3 minutes, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's, you're not going to confuse those two. But if you're just using the other one, you might, because they don't even, they're not even completely resolved from each other. There is some overlap here. So you could do it. The, also, the other good thing about using an internal standard is that you can use the relative time as an aid for identification. And this happens occasionally uh, when we'll do analysis and all of a sudden a peak will show up that's not drinking alcohol and it's not rubbing alcohol. So you see acetone with diabetics or people who are fasting. Um, but in these kids that are huffing, you'll see a large peak that's very early out here, which the, the instrument won't immediately recognize, but by knowing the relative retention time, we can go to our reference material and, and try to determine what, what it is. 